Emperor of Rome. Caesar Augustus. He built a new Rome. And a new religion. He merged them into an empire that lasted for centuries. And changed the world forever. His power, authority, and influence shaped our world. This is his story. A story of romance, intrigue, power, and conquest. Constantine the Great. Game Changer. The world knows him as Constantine, the great conqueror who managed to unite the Roman Empire and the man who turned the religion of Rome completely on its head. He's known as the man who propelled an obscure Jewish sect into the global powerhouse religion we now know as Christianity. But what most people don't know is how this incredible man got his start and how profoundly his roots shaped his thinking and then the thinking of the whole world. He was born to a peasant girl who had to prove to a group of soldiers that her son's father was the governor of the Roman province of Dalmatia, a powerful and influential man named Flavius Constantius. But once that happened, once she produced indisputable proof that the Roman governor was her baby's father, it started a chain of events that rocked the whole planet and changed the course of history. Constantine grew up to become Emperor of Rome, and his life was destined to cross that of another great world leader, Jesus Christ. At first glance, the similarities between the early lives of Constantine and Jesus are astonishing. They were both born under a cloud of illegitimacy in a remote corner of the empire. No one could have imagined their future destinies, that they would, in different ways, establish empires and rule the world. And when these empires collided, the results were incredible. The impact determined the very shape of our civilization. But there's a strange twist to this clash of empires. There's more than meets the eye. In fact, it's one of the biggest secrets of history. Stay with us to find out all about it. When we left Helena and her son Constantine at the end of episode one, they seemed to have it made. Instead of abandoning them, Constantine's father, Constantius, has called them away from Nisus, just a small town really, to come and live with him in the governor's palace. Constantius has actually married Helena, and both she and her son are being educated in all the arts of cultured Roman civilization. What could possibly go wrong? The emperor at the time was Diocletian, he had become emperor through some rather murky circumstances, and historians have long suspected that he had murdered the previous emperor. When Diocletian took the reins of power, he soon found that running a vast empire that stretched from England to North Africa and from Spain to the far reaches of the Middle East, without the technology that we take for granted today, was a huge job. He needed to find people he could trust to help him run the empire. That's why in AD 283, the Emperor Diocletian divided the empire into two sections, an Eastern Empire and a Western Empire. Then he divided responsibility for its administration among four men. On each side of the empire, there was an Augustus, the senior emperor, and there was also a Caesar, the junior to the Augustus. And so it happened that Diocletian appointed Constantius, the governor of Dalmatia, as the junior emperor of the Western Roman Empire, 
with the title of Caesar. This had consequences for Constantine and his mother. You see, Constantius now had ambitions to reach the top, and he decided to get rid of Helena. He saw her as a substandard wife. She was still just a peasant, really, not the right sort of companion for an emperor. So he divorced Helena, and he upgraded to a more appropriate wife, Theodosia, who had powerful political connections. She was the daughter of his senior emperor, Maximian, a woman who was 26 years younger than he was. Although Constantius did it for very good political reasons, you can imagine the impact this had on Helena when she heard that she was going to be replaced by a much younger woman who was of noble Roman blood. Many historians believe that it was at this point that Helena turned for comfort outside of the traditions of Rome and embraced the Christian faith. The implications of this were staggering. A member of one of the highest ranking households in the empire now belonged to a sect that the empire hated with a passion. You see, at that time, it was a crime to be a Christian. They faced severe persecution at the hands of the Romans. Christians worshiped God and not the emperor. And so they were seen as a threat to the empire and faced torture, prison and death. Thousands were massacred. And that's the faith that Constantine's mother had adopted. So now let's go back to Constantine. It's not hard to understand that Constantine probably harbored resentment for the rest of his life at how his mother had been treated when she was cast off by his father, Constantius. Now a grown man, Constantine was given the rank of centurion and sent east to work for the emperor who was always traveling, checking on the administration of the empire and inspecting its defenses. These 12 years he spent with the emperor Diocletian must have been formative. He learned how to manage an empire by watching how Diocletian did it. And Diocletian wasn't a very nice person at all. Around that time, the Emperor Diocletian was forced to deal with a serious threat to his power. And it came from an unlikely source. It came from a religious sect called the Manichaeans, which had a power base in Egypt. This group had been founded by a Persian called Mani. Now, Mani called himself an apostle of Christ, even though he promoted beliefs that were at odds with Christianity, such as reincarnation. However, Mani did borrow heavily from Christianity, as well as from other faiths such as Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and Hinduism. Now, the Romans didn't generally care what you believed in, as long as you didn't do what the Manichaeans did in Egypt. They staged a military revolt. And at this point, their religious beliefs suddenly became a big issue. Diocletian brutally quashed the rebellion in Egypt, literally sending the Manichaeans to the salt mines. And Constantine was right there alongside his emperor. Now, the Romans couldn't really differentiate between the Christians and the Manichaeans. They couldn't tell them apart. And Diocletian's junior emperor in the East, Caesar Galerius, hated Christians with a passion. So he started putting pressure on Diocletian to do something about these so-called nasty Christians who were undermining the empire. At around the same time, the pagan philosopher Porphyry started to publish a text against the Christian faith. He was a highly educated man and his attacks were so strong that Christians continued to defend themselves against them long after his death. So eventually, Diocletian decided that he needed to do something about the Christians. But he knew that persecuting Christians in the past hadn't worked. The more of them that were killed, the more they grew in numbers. So he decided to start with civil penalties first. The first thing the emperor did was to dismiss all the Christians in the army and then all the Christians who worked in the palace. 
However, when this didn't seem to have any impact, Diocletian issued an edict against Christians to be enforced throughout the empire, including in the West. They no longer had a right to worship, their church buildings were to be demolished, and their scriptures publicly burned. Christians were denied their rights so that anyone could attack them and steal from them with impunity. They were effectively non-persons. A few months later, the leaders of the church were rounded up and told that if they didn't offer sacrifices to the emperor like everyone else, they would be put to death. Then this edict was posted up in public places. That same day, a Christian by the name of Euthius lost his temper and ripped the edict down, trampling it on the ground. He was immediately arrested and taken before the magistrate. When the judge told him what the likely penalty would be, Euthius answered, if you kill me, you will not give me death, but life eternal. I pity you. The judge replied, you are an idiot, but the law does not exempt idiots from just punishment. Take him away, torture him, and then burn him on the stake. Guards took Euthius, tortured him all night, and when the sun rose, they tied him to a stake and burned him to death. It was reported that he suffered death with admirable patience and in peace. What the Emperor Diocletian wanted was for Christians to come to their senses, according to him, and offer sacrifices to the gods. But they never did. They refused. Euthius was the first victim of the infamous Diocletian persecution, but he wasn't the last. There were many. By April of AD 304, merely being a Christian incurred the death penalty. Yes, it was a deadly crime to be a Christian. In actual practice, however, the persecution of the Christians wasn't universal or uniform across the empire. It was much worse in the East because Galerius hated Christianity. In fact, in the West of the empire, it wasn't always so bad. That's where Constantius was the Caesar, the second in command. This brings us back to Constantius and Helena, because after Constantius divorced Helena and married Theodosia, they had a daughter whom they named Anastasia. Now, this is significant because this is a Christian name, meaning resurrection. Though divorced, Helena was still part of the imperial household. Maybe this Christian name was somehow due to her influence, or perhaps it was the influence of other Christians in the palace. We'll never really know. However, it seems obvious that Christians were influential in the household of Constantius. It seems likely that Constantine had been exposed to the Christian faith before he went to live with Diocletian. However, unlike his mother, he didn't become a Christian at that time but this might explain his later affinity for the religion. Shortly after his persecution of the Christians began, Diocletian did something that no other Roman emperor had ever done before. He decided that he was too old to rule. And so for the good of the empire, he chose to retire while he was still at the top of his game. Diocletian contacted the senior emperor in the West, Maximian, and he suggested that they should both step aside and promote their seconds in command to the top position. Soon after this, Constantine saw his opportunity to seize power. And the key to power was his father's army. So Constantine fled the palace in Nicomedia where he was based and traveled westward as fast as he could go. He was so desperate to get away and reach his father that he killed every horse along the imperial highway to stop any pursuers. Constantine and his father were reunited in Gaul, where they fought a battle together against the Picts, a fierce tribe from the British Isles. In that battle, Constantine fought so bravely and magnificently that the army honored the request of his dying father. And on the 25th of July, AD 306, the men took his father's purple cape 
and acclaimed him as Augustus, the ruler of the Western Empire. But Constantine didn't just want the West. He wanted the entire empire. But he still had powerful opposition. So Constantine was both smart and patient. He just waited for the right opportunity to present itself. And he didn't have to wait long. Maxentius was the son of the retired Western Augustus, Maximian. And he thought that he should rule the empire. So he convinced the city of Rome to rebel against Constantine. Now, Constantine was still a pagan who sacrificed to Apollo before every battle. However, the Christian influence in his household had continued to grow. Not only his mother, but now his stepmother Theodosia had also converted. And she even kept a Christian minister right on the premises. So now, Constantine began his long march toward Rome and his date with destiny, fighting his way against Maxentius's forces. Constantine wasn't just a great leader. He was also an inspirational fighter who led from the front. And then he camped a little distance outside of Rome itself. The battle lines were drawn. Inside Rome, Maxentius made a most unusual preemptive strike. He consulted the sacred Sibylline books, a collection of pagan prophecies, to see if he could find a prophecy there about who would win the coming battle with Constantine. The answer he got was, and I quote, tomorrow the enemy of Rome will perish. Maxentius was delighted because as far as he was concerned, the enemy of Rome was none other than Constantine. However, the Sibylline prophecy also meant that there had to be a battle the next day. And Constantine was showing no sign of attacking, which meant that Maxentius would have to strike first. Camped outside the city, a messenger brought Constantine the bad news. Maxentius claimed he had discovered a prophecy that predicted that he would win and Constantine would be killed. Now, the Romans were very superstitious and Constantine saw the spirit of his men fall as the news spread throughout his army. Constantine knew that he needed to come up with his own omen to bolster his men's spirits ahead of the coming battle. And that's when one of the most famous episodes in world history suddenly unfolded. And this is the point where the stories of Jesus and Constantine actually begin to merge. The message of Jesus Christ was spreading around the world and it had reached the very heart of the empire, Rome itself. It had even captured the allegiance of members of Constantine's own family, his inner circle. And now, as he faces his greatest challenge at the gates of Rome and desperate for supernatural powers to protect him from harm and bring him victory, Constantine reaches out and embraces Christianity and the empire of Jesus Christ. It's a clash of cultures, beliefs and faiths. But Constantine throws in his lot and aligns himself with Christianity. And under its banner, Constantine came up with his own talisman, the Cairo. Now, the Cairo is really two Greek letters blended together. The letter CHI, which looks like our letter X, but is really a CH. And the letter Rho, which looks like our letter P, but is really the letter R. It's widely recognized as a Christian symbol because together, the two letters are the first letters in the word Christ, C-H-R. Constantine told his men that he had seen the symbol in a dream and that the army had to put it on their shields because it was a guarantee that they would win. There's a legend for which no evidence exists that while the army had still been in Gaul on its way to Rome, that Constantine and indeed the whole army had seen a cross of light superimposed on the sun. Attached to it in Greek were the words, in this sign, you will conquer. And so through Constantine, 
the two empires clash and merge. Roman Christianity become entwined and interlinked. But there's a strange twist to this merger. There's more than meets the eye. Because whenever politics and religion unite, there's always a very real danger that truth will suffer and be compromised. And that is evident in this new merger right from the start. In fact, it's one of the biggest secrets of history. You see, the Cairo wasn't a new symbol at all. It predates Constantine and even predates Christ and Christianity. The Cairo was commonly used by pagans to mean good luck. Originally, it was a pagan symbol, but it was adopted by Constantine, given a Christian connotation, and at least his army now had a good omen, a sign that the gods would help them liberate the city of Rome from Maxentius. Constantine's conversion, it has often been said, smacked more of expedience and superstition than genuine religious awakening. What happened next was the famous battle of the Milvian Bridge. Early in the morning, Maxentius's army launched a surprise attack against Constantine across the Milvian Bridge outside Rome. Maxentius was certain he would win. He significantly outnumbered Constantine's army and he had the Sibylline prophecy on his side. What could possibly go wrong? But Constantine was ready. His counterattack was deadly fast and ferocious. He attacked Maxentius' army before they could even get back over the bridge to safety. In the middle of the battle, Maxentius found himself pushed off his horse and over the bridge into the water. His heavy armour meant he had no chance. His mud-covered body was found lying in the reeds the next morning. The battle was brutal and lasted all day until mid-afternoon. At the end of it, Maxentius was dead, his army had been crushed, and Constantine was the victor. On the 29th of October, AD 312, Constantine and his army rode triumphantly into the city, their shields emblazoned with the Cairo symbol, and Constantine entered with Maxentius's head on a spear. That was unusual. But there was something else that was highly unusual about Constantine's victory procession. The custom was that the conquering hero would make his way to the Capitoline Hill, where he would offer sacrifices at the Temple of Jupiter. But this time, there was no sacrifice. Jupiter didn't get the credit. This time, the honour went to the Christian God. Constantine had been influenced by his mother's religion and embraced Christianity in his hour of need. The two empires had always been at war, but now they had clashed in a very different way. Now, religion and politics came together in a way that they never had before and with momentous consequences. From that moment on, nothing in the Western world would ever be the same again. Christianity had survived the persecution of the empire, but could it now survive the embrace of the emperor and maintain its authenticity and purity? That's the challenge we all face when it comes to matters of faith, being genuine and being faithful. Because the clash of empires continues. We experience it in our daily lives. And it's a clash that can bring apathy and the temptation to compromise. That's why the Bible continually calls us to be faithful. Here's what it says in Revelation chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Do not fear, be faithful, and I will give you the crown of life. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Have you ever wondered about the chaos and confusion that we see in our world today? Have you ever wondered if God is in control of our earth? Well, if you'd like to find out more about what the Bible says concerning the clash of two empires 
we see vying for power in our world today, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our incredible journey viewers today. It's the booklet, Courage Under Fire. This booklet will take you behind the scenes and give you inside information about what's going on in our world today. This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. I guarantee there are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make the most of this wonderful opportunity to receive the free gift we have for you today. Phone or text us at 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website tij.tv to request today's free offer and we'll send it to you totally free of charge and with no obligation. Write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia, or PO Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed today's journey through history, as we followed the greatest clash of empires this world has ever seen, then be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, join me as we pray and ask for God's leading and guidance in our lives. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are there when there's a clash of empires and trouble in our lives. Help us to be the faithful people you desire us to be. We recognize that you are stronger than all of the evil in the world that seeks to do us harm and deceive us. Give us wisdom to discern what is happening in our world today and teach us to trust you so that we may be overcomers and receive your crown of life in the end. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.